G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy, and the trade period is finally over. It was, as predicted, a pretty chaotic last couple of hours there. Uh, we did the live stream earlier today, thank you for everyone who stopped by and tuned in. Um, naturally, it was kind of hard to keep track of everything that was going on, we're trying to be active with the chat, and um, you know, some of the deals sort of got clarified you know, well past the trade deadline actually ending. So in this video, I'm gonna try and take stock of every deal that we saw um, in that, when the final day in general and go through now that we actually have all of the details we need to make assessments. So we're gonna unpack or how many players switch clubs. Actually, there's too many because there's a huge super trade that we're gonna go on. I'm gonna show you what everything got traded for and we're gonna make little assessments. Bearing in mind, uh, pretty soon after this, I'm gonna start working on a full trade period review where I assess the total ins and outs for every club in the AFL. That will be on the True Footy YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe to tune into that fairly soon, I'd hope. And on that note, thank you to everyone who helped get me to 32,000 subscribers by uh, the trade period deadline. Less than a week ago, I reckon I said I wanted to hit 32,000 by the draft. Then uh, I quickly amended that to the end of the trade period and then we got there a day early. So thank you to everyone. I know there's people who commented saying they've been watching for a while, but they hadn't actually hit subscribe. So thank you to everyone who did that. So, all right, let's crack into these trades, trade by trade. So we'll start with Daniel Rioli. That got done fairly early. This one didn't really um, surprise us in the way that it got done. We, we've been hearing about this for the last few days. Um, nonetheless, the Gold Coast received Rioli and they get a third round peak in 51 and three fourth rounders in 61, 70 and 76. You'd imagine the Richmond would have had no real use for these. And uh, the, the part of the reason Richmond, you know, have so many of these late peaks is some shrewd trading last year, particularly live trading. I remember they got a pick from West Coast uh, to accumulate points and they've cashed in on that beautifully because it probably was the difference between them just getting pick six as opposed to also getting pick 23. So six and 23 is an outstanding deal here for Richmond and Gold Coast. I think they equated the points of this to about six and 47, okay? So those extra points that Gold Coast get do mitigate the deal somewhat. And we know that Gold Coast, while this is an expensive deal on the surface, like it is for a player of Daniel Rioli's quality, he's a good player, but six and 23, you'd imagine goes for some real top end players. Nonetheless, this is a different market that Gold Coast work in with their, with their academy system. So in the end, I'd imagine both clubs are fairly comfortable with the way this goes. Richmond now hold, I don't know, eight picks in the top 24 or seven. Um, so what will be interesting to see is what they do next. I'd imagine a trade up with North Melbourne could be on the cards if they want pick two. I think that could suit both parties. I'm really hoping my club tries to trade back into the first round, that being West Coast for those who don't know. Um, and Richmond have this decision of how many Players, do they want to take in the first round of this year's draft to all sign on three-year deals at the same time? Do they push an asset or two into the future? So um, we'll wait and see here on Richmond. I don't think they're done with yet. And in fact, they're not done in this video because they also had the next trade of the day, Shea Bolton and made his way to the Fremantle Dockers again. We saw this coming, but I thought this was going to be for 10 and 18. However, it is Shea Bolton and pick 14 and a future third tied to Richmond to Richmond for all of Fremantle's first three picks. So... I thought it was 10 and 18, then it was reported it might be 10 and 11, and then we found some common ground. So it's 10 and 11 really, but Fremantle upgrade 18 back up to 14, and they get a future third round pick as well. So uh, yeah, it's it's a little bit more expensive than perhaps I'd anticipated. And Fremantle, you know, uh, in the West, there's a lot of conjecture around one of the WA clubs picking Bo Allen. Uh, so I'll just point out that Fremantle now moved behind West Coast in terms of their first round draft pick. So I don't know how many people care, but it is a little interesting subplot there, um, which may impact where Bo Allen goes in this year's draft. He may end up at neither club. Richmond again, banking their picks, so sort of just covered what they might do next. For Fremantle, I think this is the right move. I mean, again, it's probably a little bit more expensive than you anticipate, but you know, some time ago, we, we wouldn't have thought Shea Bolton moving clubs was even realistic. He's a heavily contracted player. And in terms of what he brings Fremantle, he certainly brings something that they don't currently have and could be a bit of a game changer for them. He is a game changing player. Maybe not your consistent week in, week out A grader, but when he's on, he could be the difference between Fremantle being a good team and potentially a great team in 2025. We'll move on to James Peatling. This one is, um, again, I'm baffled this took so long. It is utterly ridiculous to me, but it is a weird thing for me to get frustrated on, particularly given West Coast trade period. But Adelaide received Peatling, a future third, and a future fourth for a future second round pick. Um, to GWS. So GWS clearly wanted picks in next year's draft, having a fairly good hand already. So this is a good deal for Adelaide, I have to say, on value. So not only 
Is it just a second rounder for Peatling? I mean, that was sort of considered the likely deal some time ago, but they've gotten a future third and a future fourth back. So just a little bit of change to make this even cheaper for a player who I think is fairly decent. Um, and not, regardless of him being out of contract, I think he is going to exceed what Adelaide spent on this deal. So a good move for the Crows. Again, I'm not sure why it went so late. Um, I really feel like you could have wrapped up this conversation in an hour. Maybe there were some pick swaps. I know Adelaide did switch with Melbourne, didn't they? But then they didn't use that pick on Peatling. Bailey Smith mega deal. Uh, I'm just going to get this on the screen. This is a bit to unpack. However, Bailey Smith did change clubs. So did Jack McRae. So did Matthew Kennedy. So Geelong, they get their man in Bailey Smith, which is not to be overlooked as a potentially huge acquisition and he could be the best player to switch clubs. I know that he's coming off an ACL and before that he lost form, but I just have no doubt Bailey Smith is going to be a gun for Geelong and a very talented player, possibly the most talented player to switch clubs at this current point in time. And Geelong just give up pick 17 and pick 38. So effectively, they just downgrade 38 to 45 and give up 17. And I think this is an absolute bargain so we'll move to the Bulldogs before we give a full assessment, but the Bulldogs receive 17 and Matt Kennedy and they lose Smith and McRae. To be honest, I think that's, that's actually not bad. So the thing is, you, there's a few ways to assess that. Do you assess this trade period purely on net in versus out? I mean, that's fair. But the, the extenuating circumstances here with the dogs is that he was out of contract. He wasn't necessarily pulling a Liam Baker and saying, no, you need to compensate us adequately. Geelong just really didn't have the assets that the Bulldogs were looking for. So to turn Smith into pick 17, that is a bit of a shit sandwich, but McRae then into Kennedy is probably a slight win, I would say, a few years younger, perhaps more of a defensive edge that he adds to their, their midfield. I guess what I'm saying is, do we do you slaughter the Bulldogs in a, an assessment of this because they got unders? Or do you give them some credit for maybe making the best of a bad situation? That's probably the way I'm leaning at the moment. And I think it's good to see Matt Kennedy get a new home and the Bulldogs have a new look midfield to some extent now. Well, maybe that's overstating it a little bit. But I, what I mean is the tr there's a transition going here at the Western Bulldogs. Another player left, which we'll get to. McRae made his way to St Kilda for pick 45. That's probably about right, given that he fell out of the team this year. Um, it's interesting to see what St Kilda want to get out of McRae. I feel like, as Joycey pointed out in the live stream, they're kind of going for targets in a variety of different age brackets. So McRae comes in as depth, probably you know still worth it at 45. So can't complain about that from St Kilda. And Carlton receives pick 38 for Matt Kennedy. So again, I'd love to know a little bit more about why Carlton sort of jettisoned a couple of players in Kennedy and always... Look, always ended up being a central part of them getting picked three, so I'm sure they're not fussed about that. But, you know, they're still depth players. And sure, they, is it a salary cap thing to, to lose a couple of players like this? I suppose Matt Kennedy probably was pushing for more midfield time, as I can imagine it. But 38 is not juicy for Carlton. So is this freeing up money? Is there something more to this? I'm not sure. But I think for a team that's probably in the window, it certainly sees themselves in, itself in a window, it's interesting to, you know, go in on pick three at the expense of a couple of, you know, fringe players. Could be wrong. They could draft Finn O'Sullivan. He could become the next Will Ashcroft. We'll see. I'm just saying it's uh, just a little bit interesting on the eye test. Caleb Daniel also switched clubs. This one toed and froed a little bit um, with North Melbourne dealing with Sydney, which we'll also get to shortly. But Caleb Daniel ended up moving to North Melbourne from the Western Bulldogs straight up for 25. Whereas I think the sticking point was, would it be 25 and 44 going back the other way? 25 is a fairly good deal for, for Caleb Daniel. I think that's about right for a contracted player who we know can be very good and is 28 years of age, admittedly, but I think what he adds North Melbourne uh, will exceed, you know, truly just what his FIFA rating would be. That may not make sense to people who don't play FIFA, but I guess what I'm saying is that the impact, the sum of his impact will exceed strictly what he does on the field. And North Melbourne, it's probably more expensive than they were hoping, to be honest. But at the end of the day, the Bulldogs weren't actually pushing him out. You know, if the Bulldogs were pushing him out, this could have been a cheaper deal for them. But, um, you know, I think they got a decent deal for Caleb Daniel. I think 25 is about right. North also uh, got Constanti and Parker. So again, Sydney were being difficult. Apparently, I don't know if this is 100% true, but I'm relying on my chat in the, in the stream. But people were saying that Sydney had asked for a future second and 44 for Luke Parker. Well, if they did... They buckled fairly quickly because pick 44 was enough to get Luke Parker and Jacob Constanti. Constanti is absolute steak knives in this situation because they don't think he'd been offered a new deal, deal from Sydney. So Parker for 44, again, a contracted player and super valuable. So I, I do think that the value of Parker 
for 44 will exceed the value of that draft pick to North Melbourne for where their list is at. So sure, did they pay a tiny little bit more than they'd anticipated across these two deals? Perhaps, but assuming they get a pick split done, they're going to have a couple of first rounders, I'd imagine, and they get their three senior bodies in there. So I think North should be comfortable. And finally, the Tom Barris deal. Uh, This eventually went through, which was uh, I was saying all along, despite fans telling me that uh, West Coast had fumbled it and Hawthorne weren't actually that interested. Well, I would say that Hawthorne gave up a fairly decent amount. So let's get into it. Tom Barras and a future fourth went to uh, Hawthorne and West Coast received three picks from Hawthorne, a future first, a future second, and a future third. All of those are tied to Hawthorne and not Carlton, despite Hawthorne having the choice between Carlton's picks as well. So from a West Coast point of view, I think that is all they could have realistically asked. And it actually exceeded anything we'd heard reported that Hawthorne were willing to offer to that point. So I would just contend that West Coast probably did the right thing by holding out a little bit longer. Hawthorne didn't pay through the nose, but they still increased their offer late. As for the Hawks, they get a very good player. He is 29, but I'd say he just had his second best season. And his only previous best season was probably 22. There's not a huge big gap in that. I think he was a very good defender this year. Still got plenty of footy left. A lot gets said about his back injury, but he still has played very good football since that happened. So sad to see him go. I will probably give a bit of a more in-depth reaction on my True Eagle channel, which should come soon after this video. But as a West Coast fan, I suppose like we, we probably couldn't hope for too much more. A first, a second, and a future fourth being upgraded to a future third. Would have been great to have assets in this year's draft, but that wasn't really ever on the table going into the final day. So I think both clubs will be comfortable, especially when you consider Hawthorne did pay a lot there, but they were able to do that largely because they did a deal with Carlton where 14 went to Carlton and they held now Carlton's first and second in next year's draft. So their draft presence next year is not ruined. Effectively, what they've given up is just 14 and a future third being downgraded to a future fourth because of the Carlton deal, if that makes sense. But I think West Coast has been fairly compensated here. Like I said, I'm really hopeful West Coast can still salvage the deal they did with Carlton by getting back into the first round of this year's draft, but that remains to be seen. And finally, just a few players that didn't move clubs. Now, if I've missed anyone, please let me know and I will add them to a pinned comment at the top of this video, but Xavier O'Halloran stayed at GWS as did Wade Dirks and a deal couldn't be done to the Western Bulldogs and Melbourne respectively. Devin Robertson did not happen. He will stay at the Brisbane Lions for at least one more year. Brody Kemp had a bit of late interest from St Kilda. He did not move clubs. Ivan Soldo as well. I mean, we kind of knew that going into deadline day, but that is worth saying that that did not happen. So there you go, guys. That is a summary and an immediate reaction to every trade that happened today. Like I said, if I missed anything, let me know in the comments. I'll put it in a pinned comment. But it's been hard to kind of track it. The AFL trade tracker hasn't fully updated, or at least it took a long time. And Twitter is a mess to try and decipher exactly what's going on. But I think I got them all. So let me know in the comments what you thought of today's deals, and I'll see you in the next one.